We on? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming to our talk this morning. You are in your license for bug hunting with me, Jim DeNaro, and Casey Ellis. Uh, we're going to try to provide some uh, good advice to you about how you can run a bug bounty program without getting into trouble. Uh, so here we go. Uh, is, we should probably start with some introductions uh, that give you some background on who we are, what we do, and, and where we're coming from. So I'm Jim DeNaro. I'm a cyber law attorney. I counsel co clients, uh, companies, and individuals with respect to various matters uh, relating to cyber law, such as um, export control, uh, crypto backdoors, uh, and uh, probably most relevant to this, how to disclose a vulnerability without getting in trouble. I've done a talk at DEF CON a couple times on that subject because what we have, unfortunately, in information security right now is a bit of mistrust between the government and researchers and companies about what, what the responsibilities are, what the laws are, and uh, what people really need to do so that they don't end up you know, with some kind of uh, legal trouble uh, one way or the other. So uh, that's... Um, that, that's what, that's what I'm here to try to do, and uh, that's my background. Thanks. So my name's Casey Ellis. Nice to meet you all this morning. Um, just before I, I get it started, who participates in bug bounty programs as a, as a researcher in here? Cool. Who's actually running one at the moment? And who wants to run one but hasn't started yet? Rock on. Okay, cool. So this is, this is a good mix of people, and as Jim mentioned, yeah, this is really about getting two groups of people to be able to have an ongoing conversation. So we're going to address both sides of the coin. It's going to be mostly focused on people that actually run them um, and are looking to run them and some of the uh, the issues that we've encountered when people bring that up. Um, but we'll go into that. So yeah, as I said, my name's Casey Ellis, originally from Australia, hence the accent. Apologies if I, uh, if I don't pronounce my R's correctly, um, but you'll get used to it. I'll just talk slow. I started Bug Crowd in 2013 in Sydney basically off the back of running a penetration testing company and um, doing quite well out of that. Like we, we, had, we had good people doing good work, we had good clients and all that, all that different thing. Uh, but at the same time as, as we were out there doing that, um, we started having customers coming up saying, hey listen, like if you've got one person trying to find a vulnerability and do that, hopefully before this crowd of potential adversaries finds a vulnerability, like that's not really set up right. Um, you've got one person with you know, whatever skill set they've got being paid by the hour, trying to compete intellectually and creatively with lots of different hackers, lots of different skill sets, lots of different motivations, and a reward model that's more tied to actually getting results than it is constrained by effort. What about this bug bounty thing that we've heard about Facebook doing, right? And what was happening at that point in time, I was looking to you know, find better ways to do the whole security assessment piece and, and you know, doing the whole startup thing at that point. And I started asking the question, what's stopping you? Why aren't you doing it? Um, you know, at that point in time, it, all it looked like was setting up a page, setting up a mailbox and saying, come hack us and we'll pay you, right? The answers that I got from the people that in initiated the conversation that actually became Bug Crowd, um, we're pretty consistent, and a lot of those answers we're actually going to address today. They're issues of, of logistics, they're issues of risk, they're issues of you know, operational overhead, payments, and so on. But all of that's been offset against this whole sense of the fact that this is an incredibly rewarding thing to do. Um, like looking at, looking at how you know, penetration testing, static code analysis, dynamic AppSec testing, all of the different models that we have for finding vulnerabilities in code right now work, and then adding on top of it this incredible creativity that exists within the white hat community. People had a real strong appetite to do that. So uh, Bug Crowd now has uh, around about 40,000 people in the crowd. We're actually, uh, we run the bug bounty program for OWASP. So you know, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here representing in that capacity. And what we've seen over the past period of time is this concept basically break out of the tech sector, uh, which is where it started. You know, you got your Facebooks and your Googles and your kind of pretty innovative but slightly crazy companies that, that are you know, the kinds of people that pioneer this type of thing. Actually breaking out of that space and getting into the more traditional verticals. We launched a program with MasterCard just recently, Fiat Chrysler runs a program on our platform and so on. So you know, what we're gonna go through today is really 
basically unpacking some of the some of the challenges that people throw out <clears throat> when it's talk when they're talking about or they're considering the uh, the logistics, which is the part that I bring to the talk, uh, having launched hundreds of these things and having been there for that, and then the legalities, uh, which which Jim brings to the table. I'm not a lawyer; he is, so just caveating that up front. And uh, hopefully, we uh, we get get to uh, teach you guys some, some new stuff today. All right, so here's um, a quick outline of uh, how we're, how we're going to try to frame this uh, for today. Uh, as Casey was saying, we're going to try to explain how you can configure a program and run a program so that the risks that you have from having anybody outside your organization come onto your network and try to do some security assessment work uh, so that those risks can be brought down to a, a level that, that certainly that, that, the, uh, that the company, that the client uh, is, is comfortable with uh, and certainly in any case is no different than you might have if you had hired some any other uh, sort of traditional security assessment or pen testing company to come in and do that. Um, so with these, with these various controls that, that you can implement and, and uh, set appropriately, you can balance the, the rewards being the, the number and types of vulnerabilities that are being reported to you with the risk that your organization takes by having someone from the outside come in. Uh, so it's always been, um, I think, a great sign of failure in the legal community whenever somebody says, well, we can't do this because the lawyers said so. Uh, of course, there's some things that are just plainly illegal in that case, so it's probably good advice. Um, but a lot of times, the legal side is really almost an impediment to, to, to allowing something to happen that should happen. And I think in, in the case of bug bounties, uh, that is no exception. And part of the problem is that the bug bounty model is relatively new, uh, even though the, the, the process is, is very well established at this point, from a legal point of view, uh, a sort of a profession, a discipline that moves very, very slowly and is, is very reluctant to accept change. If you just look at the IT that most law firms run, right, it's, you can see where these, where these people are coming from. Uh, so that's, we, we need to get past that. Uh, so part of what, what I'm trying to do is, is show how the, the legal issues that that are involved in running a, a bug bounty program are not the sort of thing that should that should stop uh, anyone from considering the program and, and even running the program. Just curiously, yesterday at uh, at one of the associated happy hours, I ran into a guy who was very interested in running a bug bounty program at his company. Uh, but he said there are two things that that are really holding me up. One is uh, how to how to set the budget which Casey can speak to. And the other one was the lawyers keep telling me I'm gonna have some guy from somewhere in Eastern Europe hacking my system, and this is just an unacceptable risk that we can't have. So they say no, and of course, most people, how, do you, how do you counter that? What's, what do you say uh, to, so, that, so that people can understand that this, is, this, is, this, is, this, this risk isn't something that needs to stop uh, from, from running a type of this type of program? So. These, these things are, are generally uh, under the headings of uncertainty and liability. Uh, uncertainty about who's going to be on the system, about what, they, about what might happen if they, if they do find a vulnerability, uh, and liability uh, mostly from the perspective of certainly people within the organization. What happens if I hire uh, a bunch of hackers to come in and something bad happens to this to my to my uh, environment? Am I personally liable? Is my company liable? Is this bad for me? Uh, and then liability, of course, with respect to um, you know, the hackers as well. They're, they they certainly have some concern about some trouble they might get into as well when they go onto someone else's system. And Some, then, yep. Something, Sorry. something, something to just tap on there, um, and, and we're talking about this just before as well. This is a novel concept. Like we've seen, we've seen the the adoption of bug bounties and the noise around. You know, definitely the concept of a public program <clears throat> explode pretty rapidly over the past three years, which was you know great for us as a company, and I think good for the industry as well. It seems to be something that now has traction to the point where it will become normal. Um, but these these questions of uncertainty and liability, they're pretty familiar. Uh, for those of you who are around when, when pen testing was first becoming a thing back in you know, the early 2000s, right? What, what were the questions we were being asked at that point? You know, what's the legality of inviting someone in to hack my stuff? What kind of risks are we exposing ourselves to from, from a, a logistical or an operational standpoint? And we overcame those, right? It's also reminiscent of you know, 
mid to late 2000s uh, when the whole idea of storing vulnerability data in the cloud started to become a thing. You know, it was insanity for a period of time as people got used to the idea as a transition from being novel and interesting to being conventional wisdom. But we got there in the end. So I think you know, my pick about how this whole market is moving is that we're in that same transition right now with, with bug bounty programs, and that's some of the stuff we're going to spell out today. So historically, when we there's there's sort of also historical explanation for how we got to where we are today. Uh, so there there's um, there there are two big issues that that keep coming up legally. One is um, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is kind of like a sword and a shield for people running bug bounty programs. Uh, and the other is the issue of responsible disclosure. And as we will explain in, the, in this talk, these are not really concerns uh, that, that should get in the way of, of running a program. Uh, so of course, the, there's just such a long history of, uh, of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act being applied against researchers, uh, some of whom are sort of like heroes of the, of the community, uh, like Aaron Swartz, and some who are anti-heroes, perhaps like Andrew Ornheimer, a.k.a. Weave. And it creates uncertainty about what people are allowed to do on your network. Uh, so if you're if you're running a, pro a program, that's something you might you might have um, some concern about. Uh, and with respect to uh, responsible disclosure, of course, that's a very complicated uh, issue. Is there emotional uh, aspects to it? it? There's so many different parties with so many different viewpoints on it. Uh, that that's also very very hard to navigate. But as we'll, as we'll explain, that's also not really um, it's, it's not really implicated by running a bug bounty program. And in fact, um, bug bounty programs really solve most of the problems that you have. It's sort of like the, the opposite effect. Like if you if you if you don't want to have to worry about the computer fraud and abuse act, and you don't want to have to worry about responsible disclosure issues, then what you need to do is run a bug bounty program. Uh, so because because um, because Casey is from Australia, and because I'm a lawyer, and I like analysis. Um, we kind of uh, thought of a, a way to look at, think about bug bounty programs as um, as a shark, uh, as an analogy, uh, because it's it's really a matter of perceived of, of perceived risk versus uh, the, the actual risk that that someone has when they when they get in the water. Uh, so if if a bug bounty program is a shark, uh, there's you know people have a perception that maybe this is like some kind of dangerous uh, dangerous animal, or in the case of a, of a bug bounty program, a tool uh, that that we have to be very careful with, uh, and in, in the way the way the way I see it, and the way I think Casey sees it as well, is that it is a very powerful animal and a very powerful tool. But if you understand what it does and how it operates and where it is, uh, and and put in proper controls. It's actually quite an amazing thing, and if you have a shark on your team, that's really great, right? Uh, you just want to make sure you understand how the shark operates uh, and, and and put in the proper controls and safeguards. Um, at which point, the shark is kind of like your friend. Actually, you should celebrate celebrate the shark. So. <laughs> celebrate the shark hashtag. Um, yeah, I mean, sharks is a part of an ecosystem. They're vital, right? I, I think this is a lot like it's a lot like bug bounty programs. I think it's a lot like how we we perceive, not necessarily in the security industry, but when we're trying to basically convince people within our organization to adopt this model. Um, to let scary hacker people that wear balaclavas and, and hunch over laptops in their parents' basement uh, do this type of thing. For starters, that stereotype is, is inaccurate, as we all know. Um, but if you do a Google image search on the word hackers, you can understand why it's still pretty pervasive. Um, <clears throat> but you know, it, it's a similar sort of thing. Like Sharks are actually they're scary, but they're mostly scary because we've been taught to fear them. Um, the statistical, like statistically, you're more likely to die by getting hit on the head by a coconut than than getting eaten by a shark. That's a that's a true stat, I'm told. Um, so you know, and it's it's a similar sort of thing with, with with engaging the hacker community, engaging bug bounty programs, getting into this type of thing. You know, the reality of it is, yes, as Jim said, it's a powerful tool, and you need to manage it carefully and effectively. Um, but the actual risk versus the perceived risk, there's quite a delta there, which kind of leads on to the next slide. You know, the thing that happens, and this is this is where we get back to the reward part, right? <clears throat> every time we launch a program, and I think pretty much every time I've I've seen or spoken to companies that have launched their own programs, you know, independent of Bug Crowd on their own platform somewhere else or whatever, 
there's always this period of like, holy crap, um, where you know what they've what they've done is basically started to clear out the assurance debt that they have in their in their targets. And the reason for that is that you've got all of these different sets of skills. You've got you know people that have their own unique ways of approaching uh, exploitation. And, and what they're doing is they're finding gaps that have been left by everything that's done, that's been done to date. So like it stands to reason that if you're not doing this, you're actually still vulnerable to things that would be found using this method. That's been consistently true for us. We ge we generally have you know something that we would list as high or critical severity come in within the first 48 hours of a program. We actually uh, tweeted a stat the other day. You know, Bug Crowd's priority rating system. If we call it critical, it's actually critical. We don't inflate. Um, so it's basically Joe Internet to God mode type stuff, uh, and we see one of those on average every day, coming coming through the platform. And it's not because you know, yeah, we do a bunch of stuff to make it useful and all of that, but that's it's actually the power of the model. It, this is not a this is not a bug crowd pitch per se. It's pitching the crowd and saying like, getting them engaged to do this work is radically more effective than than basically anything that's out there right now in terms of finishing off that gap and making sure that. Yeah, if you want to compare yourself against the true risk of being attacked by an adversary, this is pretty much the the, the best way, best of breed way to do things right now. So, <clears throat> you know, when we're talking about these risks, it's going to be mostly couched around. Okay, here's the problems that people point out. It's very important to keep the reward in mind and and sort of couch it like that. Have it have it framed up as okay, this is actually pretty much best of breed in terms of being able to identify these vulnerabilities and fix them better than everything that I'm doing right now. There's going to come in a come in point come a point in time where it's expected of organizations to do this. So the question shouldn't so much be if as as much as it should be how and, and when. Jump into this. Okay, so here I'd like to try to tackle one of the the, the biggest issues in uncertainty that um, is that is currently out there that, that the biggest one of the biggest concerns that people have, which is what happens if I've got somebody in another country who is part of a bug bounty program and this person goes a little bit too far. Um, this I, this is this is a concern that's raised that's raised all the time. How when when the legal department says, well, what about the hacker in Estonia or wherever it is that 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 we don't know and, and can't trust? Um, the re the way I would look at that is that the risk you take by having that person pen testing on your system is no greater than the risk you have right now. Uh, because let's say you had a, a public program uh, and anyone could come in and without privileged access and pen test your system for credit and possible monetary reward, whatever the, the, the benefit that's being offered happens to be as part of that program. Well, that's great. The person may be motivated to come in and do that in, in exchange for those benefits that you're, that you're providing as part of the bounty program, uh, but they don't have to. Even if you didn't have the program, that person can pen test your system, your, your system, right now. They're already doing it, and you know they're doing it because you see it in the logs. Um, the, pro the problem you have now, without, the, without running a bounty program, is that person has not a whole lot of incentive to tell you about it uh, because you're, they may not because because they're falling into the responsible disclosure problem, and they're worried about all those issues that every all the researchers have with the responsible disclosure. If I go and report this vulnerability to the company, is the company going to get mad? Are they going to try to threaten legal action against me? Will they just ignore me? Am I wasting my time? Uh, and so on. So there's a lot of well, I found this thing, and maybe I don't really care. Just and you shove it away, or maybe it's really interesting. You might try to sell it. Uh, so that there's kind of this sort of market failure that's happening right now. But in terms of the security of the system, you're already you're already there. That risk is already is already happening to you. You're you're being pen tested. So all so basically, the a bug bounty program kind of turns that risk around and, and sets it up so that okay, now that same person can do that exact same thing on your system. Uh, but now they're motivated to actually actually disclose it to you because they don't have to worry about the computer fraud and abuse act so much because you they're basically operating with your permission to do what they're going to do and they don't have to worry to figure out how to disclose it because there's a there's a whole program set up for how to disclose it 
And you're basically guaranteed that the researcher is basically guaranteed that they'll, they'll get a response from the, from the company as well. Um, so basically, what you've done is you've taken the risk that was basically that was being borne by the company that they're being pen tested by the public at large all the time, and you're actually reducing the risk to that company by incentivizing the disclosures for those for those for those very same activities. Absolutely. I mean, the the whole thing with uncertainty is is that people that are in the position of not having stepped in onto the front foot about doing this yet. They don't know what the risks are, and they're concerned about losing control to people that they've been trained not to trust. So, you know, that's really what it comes down to there. Um, and to Jim's point, you know, a lot of the stuff around how, how do we predict the behavior of people that, you know, we've been taught to believe are completely unpredictable, that's a valid reaction uh, to have to, you know, trying to step forward into this kind of process. But at the same time, you know, the point's valid. You can control your vulnerabilities if you know where they are. You can't necessarily control the, the behavior of, of an adversary. So it stands to reason to prioritize the former. What we did, um, so BugCrowd does a lot of surveying of, of customers, and, and this is basically, this is a, a set of answers that we got from people that were in the bucket of, okay, I think I'm gonna do this at some point. Uh, I'm not ready to start just yet. So they've gone from you know, off the back foot onto the front foot around the whole bug bouncy model, but they, actually haven't, they haven't actually pulled the trigger on, on launching a program yet. Interesting thing about this uh, and something to call out is that the, uh, the difference between what pops up here and the kind of results that we get from people that are saying, no, I'm, I'm scared or I'm not ready at all. This is a bad idea. Um, the focus of these results is more on operational considerations. It's, it's gone from being scary to being difficult. It's like, okay, cool, I'm no longer fearful of, of this idea. What I'm now concerned about is how to actually make it work within, within my organization, um, how to make it successful, how to you know, be the person as the stakeholder within the company who's put their hand up, you know, not getting fired, ideally, um, <clears throat> and, and all of those types of things. So you, know, you can see some of the stuff that we've put in here. Budget is a really interesting question that comes up. We'll tap into that shortly. But really, the, the whole thing there is the bug bounty model is the first to find each unique vulnerability gets paid for it. And the more severe the vulnerability is, the more they get paid. So OK, if you're launching a program, you don't know how many vulnerabilities you have. That's kind of the point. So how do you budget for that? Um, and it's a good question. There's answers to that. Uh, but that's one of the big ones that comes up. Basically, the way <coughs> that <coughs> excuse me, um, the way that bug bounties have evolved, like I think the the perception that that people have of what a bug bounty program is, excuse me, <coughs> is is the public stuff you see. So it's someone who's set up a page, either on their own site with a partner, whatever else. They've created some sort of intake vehicle. Uh, or, or you know, brought in an intake vehicle to receive vulnerability reports, and they issue payouts based on the validity of the vulnerability, its uniqueness, and, and its impact. Right? What's happened since then? I think that's that's the thing that you you know you read about in TechCrunch. Um, you know, the press is still very interested in talking about companies when they launch these programs because, as I said before, this is still at a fairly novel stage of, of evolution uh, as a as an industry. But what's happening in the background is the uh, the concepts basically evolving. So that's bug bounty 1.0. Um, bug bounty 2.0 is when you start to learn about the crowd from their behavior in these public programs, and start to apply them in ways that add more control and more trust, and also can add more predictability to the results by matching the right skills with the right targets and so on. So this is something that we've been doing for a long time. Others are doing it as well. I think uh, if you LinkedIn came out. And, and basically did a big riff on how they're running a public program without an incentive, but then using that to feed a private program that they wrap more controls around and add more trust to. So once they've got people within that private program, they can make a decision whether or not to give them privileged access to a, to a target, for example. So essentially, there's three types of program um, that, that are out there at the moment. <clears throat> and, and BugCrowd runs these, but I, you know, I want to call out that this is, this is not just a BugCrowd thing. It's actually what we're seeing as an evolution of the concept itself. There's the public program, which I just mentioned. You're all familiar with that. Private programs are essentially the same as a public program in, in their economics and their nature, but they're running on an ongoing basis. And you can do things like cycle researches in and out, tweak your rewards, all of that kind of stuff. That's where you know, privileged access becomes a thing. And, and what we're seeing is, is folks that um, really, you know, they're looking at that 
approach to bug bounties as a replacement for some of the things that they've been doing on a continuous scanning basis in the past, right? They, they want better security testing. They've been running a vendor, internal tools, whatever else. They're at a point where they're questioning the ROI and they either want this as an additive thing or as a, as a true replacement. Um, <clears throat> the third is what we call on demand. So that's essentially like hackers as a service. Uh, being in a position where you can say, cool, I want to deploy this same bug bounty model but I actually want to deploy it on a project basis. I want it to have a start date and a stop date. And same thing here, what we're seeing is, is people looking at this as an evolution of, of traditional uh, web app and network pen testing. So they, they're saying we've got a project that we want to get done for whatever reason, it could be compliance, it could be uh, you know, a new product launch, it could be an acquisition, it could be any, any one of the reasons that you do that type of work. But they want to be able to access the creativity and really the power of a community instead of relying on single individuals to do that work, right? So that's that's the third the third version. And as I said again, this is this is what we're seeing kind of evolve over time. Yes? How do you find that these programs scale, right? So if I've got like four hundred applications yep. like that, and you come across organizations kind of facing you know, seeing how this fits in yeah, so the question is around the scale issue. I, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> you know, at the moment, the the, the registered community on, on Bug Crowd is about 40,000 people. Um, so yeah, it, there's enough people there to do the work and scale it out because it's it's not someone sitting down for, for two weeks doing a test. It's basically different people applying different skill sets uh, against the target. So yeah, what we're seeing is it scales scales very very well, and especially when you compare it against um, yeah you know, one of the one of the big factors I think that's driving enterprise adoption of this model is the fact that there's you know 209,000 unfilled jobs in cybersecurity in the U.S. right now. So going out and actually employing people, be it from a third party consultant or in house, is, is already pretty difficult. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers that question. And yeah, just calling out some of the things that that people look at. In terms of you know what is important to know about a researcher, accuracy is it someone who is a you know a sharpshooter or are, are they more of a kind of spray and pray type of type of researcher? Um, you do get people that come in and try to game the system, uh, so they'll they'll see the fact that okay the, the reward model is to be first, so I'm just going to bulk download a bunch of like hypothetical vulnerabilities and see what happens. You want to be able to identify that behavior and basically filter that person out and hopefully train them not to do that in the future because they might be useful at some point. Um, activity in terms of like what is the activation cost of a particular person. So what we see there is you know folks that come from countries with lower purchase power parity, you're going to get more intensity and more effort from them compared to someone from somewhere like the US or, or Australia where a thousand dollars is worth comparatively less. Does that make sense? So that's another one. Impact. Um, that's a fun one. I, you know, there, there's people that approach security assessment like a QA role. Uh, then there's people that actually have a builder background and they understand how things are constructed. And then there's people that are just evil geniuses uh, that, that actually don't want to be criminals, but they, they're thinking about like impact and outcome. Ultimately, you want to spread, like we all glorify and, and get all excited about the top category, but ultimately you want all three uh, because the, the, you know, the little vulnerabilities matter too. Uh, and then trust, as I mentioned before, there is the ability once you get to know these people over time to start to trust them more. And at that point, you can start giving them privileged access to things that you know you wouldn't necessarily expose out to the public internet or to people that you don't trust, right? So actually, staying on this for just a minute, sure. uh, the the public versus private yeah. distinction uh, is is extremely important when trying to. Uh, socialize the, the bounty concept to, to the legal department uh, uh, or management yeah. or risk officers and the like. Um, and it's almost another type of uncertainty because the, the label bug bounty or hackers for hire or whatever uh, is is almost really not just descriptive enough because the programs have now gotten so complex and they're, it's, they're so configurable that's not that's not really a complete explanation. And the difference between a public and private program, while it's still a, a bug bounty program, is so significant from uh, the point 
point of view of, of management and, and the legal departments uh, that it's um, it, that really that the fact that you, you're considering uh, perhaps a private program uh, with with, uh, with with potentially much stricter controls about who's in the crowd that needs to bubble up to the top of the presentation yeah. when when going uh, up the, up the ladder with this because uh, essentially what you end up with if you said okay I only want people in who are U.S. citizens residing in the United States who you know pass my identity checks and so forth you've got and who have a track record already of, of doing a good job and not doing doing things that, that, that we didn't like um, you've got people who are like essentially model employees if they were at XYZ consulting yeah. company doing that they'd be great but they're just that doesn't fit their lifestyle whatever they don't want to do that that's so they're not doing that they probably could go get that job if it didn't conflict with whatever else it is um, in their lives so you've got you've got this you've got people who are extremely reliable and extremely safe uh, who, who, and you can limit the program to just them. Uh, now, flip, turning back to some of the legal issues we were talking about earlier with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, that's the sword and shield again that you have, uh, because that that researcher, who is obviously well known uh, to to you uh, and is is findable in, in the United States, if that person is goes rogue and as as they say and does something that's just really ridiculous that harms your company, um, you do have the potential of legal action against them. Uh, not that you want to do that. We look forward to that, but they know that, and you know that. Uh, so everyone kind of—that's just another reason that people are incentivized to play by the rules. Um, so that, so your risk there is is, is very well controlled uh, and and, and known uh, known to you at the time you're going into into a private program like that. Uh, it's almost uh, you could almost think you have more risk if you went with um, an outside. Uh, traditional security assessment uh, platform because there, if that company is big enough to outsource it to somebody in wherever, some other country or you know, some other unknown person, if, if that's how, if that's what the business model is, you're actually, then you really don't know who those people are. So you're almost taking more risk if you don't know uh, who, who, who is doing it. So really the, the private program, the risk level is kind of the only way you could possibly get uh, probably a, a lower risk uh, to the organization legally, uh, business-wise, would be to actually go and pick certain people. Like I know this guy, exactly that person in Idaho, I'm gonna pluck him up <laughs> and I'm and ask him to come in and do it as an independent contractor. Um, otherwise, it's really hard to. Uh, it's you know, and and he's clear too. You know? So other than that, it's really hard to. I mean, I think we really optimize the private program. Really optimizes the risk um, to a level that um, should be very easy uh, to sell up the chain. Absolutely. <clears throat> so speaking speaking to the sword and shield thing, really it hinges on on, on the brief. What, what does the brief look like that you put out there? Um, because that becomes essentially the contract that uh, that researchers are entering into when they're when they're doing this type of work. Because by default, this stuff is actually illegal. So you've got that as a backstop um, going out and, and and you know particularly hosted targets. It's less so the case with with IoT and things that are installable, but but definitely for hosted instruments, this is. You know, part of the way to think about it, right? Here's the permission that we're giving you. Here are the constraints. Here is the criteria. If you follow these rules, then we commit to basically giving you safe harbor for that, for starters. But then on top of that, giving you incentive and and you know making commitments to be responsive, treat you well, and and actually generally strike up a relationship with these people so you can create a feedback loop going forward. That's kind of the goal, right? Um, when you look at what is typically in a in a bounty brief, you know you've got the actual scope. What are you trying to steer people towards? Like, what are you pointing them at? You got things that are out of scope. What do you want them not to touch? And there could be any one of a million reasons for that. Um, one of the common ones is, oh yeah, we've got this box that runs NT4 uh, that you know has a core line of business application on it. And we haven't been able to update it because the company went out of business or whatever. We know what's vulnerable, we're mitigating those risks. We actually don't want a crowd to hit on it because it's fragile, right? Okay, cool, say that. That's fine, that's okay to say. Just to, just to tap on this real quick, like the crowd is actually learning how to interact with this as well. This is not just about, and I think what we're seeing over time is that this style and, and set of rules of engagement, it's normalizing out between the people that run these programs and the people that are participating in the crowd. So as we go further and further along, they're starting to expect this type of thing, which is really cool. The rewards are obviously a pretty a pretty strong lever to pull. Um, what we recommend with with uh, with people is they start their rewards at a sane level so they don't run out of budget. That's that's I'll tap on that more in a second. But then once you get to the point where 
you know, the program starting to normalize, you can dial up the rewards and actually drive people deeper and deeper into the, uh, into the target space. And then the rules. Rules are an interesting one. It's, it, it's you know, going to be specific to each organization. Uh, for instance, Tesla, they've got a rule up there, and it's kind of intuitive when you think about it, but they've called it out. Yes, you're okay to hack cars, power walls, all of the different devices, but please only do it on your own stuff or stuff that you have permission to, to, to test. Like, don't go out and uh, drive to Mark Andreessen's place and, and hack his Tesla. That's not okay. And it's, you know, I mean, it's intuitive, but they call that out specifically because it's important. So uh, on, with respect to the, uh, the scope, uh, setting the in-scope and out-of-scope in, in the bug bounty, that is, from a, again, from a risk perspective, risk management perspective, one, one of the most important uh, tools that you have. Uh, because, again, turning back to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act or whatever other legal options you might have, the, the scope, setting the scope is, as, as you know, it lets the, the, lets the bounty hunter know what they are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. So if you say, and you combine that with what we were talking about earlier with, um, in, in a private program, saying, okay, I only want, so if you say you're the most these risk are, adverse. These are, these are people that we know will follow those rules. Exactly. Closely, yeah. Exactly. You say if you are the most risk averse uh, enterprise out there. You say, I need to have the maximal recourse against someone in the crowd if something goes wrong. I need the most control. So what you could do is you say, I only want people who are identity, identity verified in the United States, and then set your scope narrow. Yeah. Uh, and then be, and then everybody knows, so, okay, if I go out of that, the researchers know if they go out of that out of that narrow scope, yes, you can find them. <laughs> and, and yes, they, they've done something wrong. Uh, so that you're, you, you really can, can drive that risk into Absolutely. a really very small space at that point. And again, coming back to the reward and the upside of it, they're learning, they're learning that that's normal. That's, this is what it comes back to. Because we're talking about a, a bunch of stuff that sounds kind of onerous. Um, but it's really just leveraging what the default state is to make sure that everyone's safe and the expectations are aligned. So going into some of this stuff real quick, uh, budgeting, you know, it's not a blank check. It doesn't need to be a blank check. That's the, that's the TLDR. What we're seeing, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, is people starting their, their initial rewards at a fairly conservative level and then ratcheting it up over time uh, to drive people deeper down. And to me, that's the most sane way to put it. You miss out the opportunity to go out and, and get a big, you know, XYZ company offers $5 million top reward. Like people say that, no one actually ever pays it out as an aside, but whatever. Um, so say, staying sane with where you set your rewards, making sure you, you actually fulfill those expectations and then dialing it up in a sane way that's going to fit to your budget over time. Uh, we've got a bunch of stuff in the platform that helps people basically predict that and figure out when, when the right time is to do that with their budget in mind as well. There's also basically adaptations of the core bug bounty model that are starting to uh, starting to become more popular. Um, one of the things that we do for for project based work on the, in the on demand model is is basically add a dilutive component to the reward pool. So if it's you know a twenty thousand dollar reward pool for a project, and over time we we've got a we end up in a position where there's more vulnerabilities than there was initial reward to cover that will actually start to dilute back the reward pool to make sure that the cost to the uh, to the customer is not breached. Plus, if that's happening quickly, we'll actually shut down the program and make sure that it doesn't dilute too much so everyone stays happy. And again, the researchers are learning to expect this. They're like, okay, we get it. We understand the purpose of that model. Um, we can choose not to engage if we don't like it, but we actually do because those types of programs tend to be you know, more exclusive, more uh, interesting targets and so on. Getting internal buy-in, like hopefully you guys can can take some of this stuff away and um, and actually use it uh, because you know to me there's a lot of these kind of guttural reactions that people that are outside the security industry have to this model that are pretty easily explainable. Uh, there are risks that you know can very easily be mitigated, and you know. You offset that against the rewards, some of the stuff that we were talking about before with the results. Legal questions, Jim's jumped into that. I'm starting to speed up a little bit because I know we're running out of time. So we want to cut over to liability. Okay, do, so. We can do the lawyer bit. <laughs> okay, so there's, there's an, another um, legal point that, that's, um, that's worth, worth mentioning because it, it does help 
uh, motivate the use of a bug bounty program to, to management or to uh, or to legal. So there there are well, and Casey can can provide more information on this. But there are there are numerous well documented cases where uh, an organization has already had significant amount of security assessment already done. Then they bring in the crowd and they find a whole slew of new and interesting vulnerabilities that they didn't know they had before. Yeah. So there's pretty good evidence that the that you that leveraging the crowd does add value and make the system more secure. Um, so I think we are, we are, we are headed down, down the road to, to an environment where if you don't use the crowd, you actually are taking on more legal risk because you are opening yourself up to the argument that you did not use um, a tool that has been proven to be more effective than alternatives. Um, so, of course, it's not a knockdown. It's not a knockdown argument. No legal argument ever it is. But I think it would be very helpful to be able to say, yes, well, maybe we maybe we use this uh, traditional tool, maybe not. But we did use something uh, that that has been proven to be better. And that 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 is. Um, if certainly, if I was on the other side of it, I would want to make the argument that they, that someone didn't uh, do it uh, otherwise. So, the, legally, at the end of the day, the the biggest question probably is is always is always going to be what happens uh, if a hacker goes rogue. Um, so before we try to try to get a little bit of a handle on that, it's worth thinking about just what what do we mean if a if a hacker goes goes through? In case you want to, yeah, for sure, give some examples. There's there's variations on on what people uh, are saying uh, when when you know that comes up. We we hear the question a lot, and and we get the opportunity to explain through it a lot. Generally, what it means is one of two things: uh, they're going to basically conduct a, a breach for real. Uh, and go and either manipulate business processes or steal data and do something malicious with it. The response to that, <clears throat> you know, alongside some of the mis uh, the risk mitigation, risk mitigation stuff that we've just spoken about, is is that you know if the vulnerability is present to allow that, then you're already at risk of that. Uh, this is, you know the issue comes back to okay, this is a pretty phenomenal way to actually reduce that risk. And mitigate the chance of that happening in the first place, regardless of who rocks up at the door and, and starts hacking. So that's the response to that. The other is around basically rogue disclosure. So the idea of you know people doing people doing vulnerability research, finding something, wanting to disclose it, and going off and disclosing it despite not having permission from the company. Um, it's an interesting one. The the risk of that is is far greater. It's still actually pretty uncommon at this point. Uh, but the risk of that is far greater on public programs because you haven't got, you know, at that point you're not inviting people that you know will, will play by the rules and, and basically only do that if and when you say it's okay. Uh, and, you know, I think responsible disclosure, coordinated disclosure of vulnerabilities is becoming pretty de facto amongst technology companies. There's, you know, ISO standards, there's all sorts of things going on. And ideologically, I believe in it as, as the right way to do things. The reality of it is that it scares the heck out of most of, most of the rest of the market. You know, people look at, the, look at it as, okay, we're going to have our dirty laundry aired, and they're not quite in a position to accept it yet. So, you know, the fear of that is logical in some senses. I think once that sort of thing happens, people realize that it's not so bad and it carries forward. But really what it comes down to is making sure, again, if that's a concern for you, then reduce the risk, reduce the participation, get used to that part of the process first, clean up your, your shop so there's less to be found in the first place, and then start to think about opening it out and allowing more people into the mix. So that's kind of where the shark analogy comes in. Right, so it, it's there. There are sharks out there, but if you know what you're doing, you know where the sharks are, and, and you and you uh, handle it appropriately, your risk of getting bitten or, or even seeing a shark is actually pretty small. Sharks don't like people <laughs> very much. I mean, that's that's what tastes it comes that down. good. <laughs> um, but so so from a from a legal perspective, the. You're, you're, you're charged with acting responsibly uh, on behalf of your organization. And if you ramp up a program, uh, you are acting responsibly and you really, you've done your, 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 the, the appropriate CYA. Mm -hmm. So if you, if, you, if you walk in and you say, okay, great, um, we've never had any security assessment done before, let's just give the, the, the public just huge scope and just let everybody come in and, and have at it. Yeah, if something, well, first of all, not only, everyone could do that anytime anyway, right? Uh, but let's just say 
something bad happens at that point, then yeah, you, you may have some explaining to do, right? It's gonna be a little bit hard to, to explain why you decided this was a great idea, even if hackers are jiggling your doorknobs all day long anyway. Um, so you start small, you start with a smaller scope, or you start with, you start with just private. Uh, and then you, you build up to a point where you can say, yes, we've had members of the crowd hitting on our system, and we found some vulns, we fixed them, we did it a couple times, we've gotten to the point now we think we are just super secure. Yep. We really can't find anything wrong. Let's let's open it up even more. And this is this is a way to you, you slowly scale up the risk. You can prove that everything you did was completely reasonable and justified. Um, and you really get yourself. And you end up at, when you get to the top of that, you end up with having the, the most complete uh, vulnerability testing on your system while minimizing the risk to yourself career-wise uh, and and to your organization. Absolutely. You want to tap forward here? Let's go. All right, so um, let's, actually, I think maybe we should just get the, should we just get the questions since we're about 12 minutes out? Let's do that. Any questions? How do you guys mitigate against competing um, companies setting up their own and uh, uh, such as like, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of an example, but I guess like if you set up a bounty, and uh, people generally think it's low. Thank you. So if you set up a bug bounty program and people generally think it's low, right, um, for whatever reward, I guess in that whole range of why they go rogue and all that stuff, what are you doing to mitigate other companies going like, because I believe when iOS set up, uh, Apple, I mean, set up an iOS bug bounty program, um, they set up around 200,000 for a bounty, and then another competing company was like, oh, if you sell it to us, we'll give you 500,000 for that. Yeah, sure, so that's, that's a great question. Um, you're talking about basically the offensive versus the defensive market is really what it comes down to. And, and the way, that's the way I like to talk about it. People say black hat, white hat, gray hat, it gets too messy. I, I think the easiest way to think about it is people that purchase vulnerability data for the purpose of killing a bug versus people that purchase it for the purpose of creating a product and keeping that bug alive so the product's useful, right? Um, <clears throat> the interesting bit of economics that's in play there is that um, basically the first, you know, the defensive vulnerability model, the, the point of value for the, for the hacker and for the person running the program is at that initial exchange of information. And, and then from that point on, there's no, there's no value in new information because they've learned it at that point and they can go off and, and fix it. So what that does, because that's setting up basically almost the prisoner's dilemma out, out, in, in, out in hacker land, it's, it's pretty much a matter of the first one to blink is the one who, who will get paid for that vulnerability, at which point the folks that are doing offensive, offensive um, procurement, their products actually basically tank in price uh, or value at that point, right? You're selling, you're going off and paying 1.5 million for an ISO day, and then all of a sudden it turns, out, turns up in a jailbreak and gets patched. Yeah, okay, that's no good to the people that want to use that type of vulnerability for, for surveillance or, or whatever else. So the, 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 the reason I'm kind of calling it out like that is that the economics are actually aren't on parity. Um, people tend to think that they are. It's like, why doesn't Apple offer 1.5 million as well? It's because they actually don't need to. Um, that, that's the reality of it at this point. So <clears throat> that's for stuff that... Uh, is purchased by people that do surveillance and there's quite a hot market around it. Downstream when you're talking about vulnerabilities in Facebook, for example, like there isn't really much of a black market for that. So, so the, the, the competing market for, for procurement of um, vulnerability data in hosted platforms, you don't see it. You do, you do see it very, very occasionally, but there isn't like an established market for it. Um, so it's actually quite difficult to do. And the main reason for it is once it's fixed, it's fixed. Like it's, it's fixed in one place, any exploit is probably gonna be detected and then it's gone. So, you know, that's, that, those are some of the, the economics that are in play that mitigate it, I think almost naturally. Um, in terms of actual risk mitigation, you know, we just, we just keep a very close eye on who's talking to who and, uh, and try to keep an eye on where data's flowing. Yeah. You have a way of, um, I assume you have a way of vetting your, your crowd, 
Um, is it just problem exposure? Or how's that work? Yeah, sure. So going back to going back to the the metrics that we're using, uh, a lot of it's around skill. What are they actually capable of? Because that's that's the thing that we can assess very quickly. Um, the thing that's slower to to assess is trust. Uh, so what we do to assess trust is three. There's basically three things. Uh, one is behavioural analysis essentially like we're watching their behavior in programs we're looking to see is this someone who who understands that you know if there are rules set out then those rules need to be followed or is this someone who we can't necessarily rely on to, to have that as something that they do because I mean 40,000 hackers not all of them get that um, we, we do have a large contingent that do and we've vetted them out but not all of them do so it's a matter of figuring out who's who and then taking the ones that don't and helping them understand the fact that if they if they can prove themselves as able to do that, there's more opportunity for them in the future. The other two things are identity verification. Um, so we use a third party provider for that. And then background checking, which is another third party provided service. And essentially that 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 um, you know background checking is an interesting one. I um, I'm not a fan of background checks because I think most of the best criminals would probably pass one. Um, but it's the de facto standard for how people determine whether or not they should trust people doing security work. So for that, it's just a matter of, okay, we need to provide that, it's important, and it does give you some level of comfort around, around the person's um, you know, criminality or not. Sure. Uh, and my other question is, you talk about the platform, can you give an idea of what the functionality of that platform is? Yeah, I mean, I, I can talk about that all day. I don't, I don't want to dive uh, just a, just a too, too deeply into it. it right now. Basically, the platform's set up to allow it, it, it's it's a, it's a marketplace in some senses, and it's a SaaS platform in others. So the, the marketplace component is, you know, the bits that we do for the researchers from a from a social standpoint. You know, they they can build out a resume on there and so on. Um, they're obviously getting paid, so there's that component to it. And then there's the vulnerability intake component to it, which is where pretty much everything comes in. We normalize the data so it's easier to process. We actually have a team in-house that helps out with triage and validation and, and community management and so on. Then on the customer side, what they're getting, you know, the, the goal of it is to, to make it as easy for them to get to the signal uh, as possible and for it, for it to be as easy for them to triage and prioritize the different vulnerabilities as possible. So that's kind of how we've optimized the design of all of that and yeah, that's that's the very short story of it but you know, anyone who wants to know more about that you can come up and say hello afterwards. Thanks. Welcome. What's your um, recommended approach? So we have a... Uh, uh, Mike. Mike. <laughs> Jump in Mike from Mike, um, yeah. what's your recommended approach for, um, so so we want to make sure we have a pen test team and we, we're about to start a program, um, assuming we use you guys, how does a platform support and what do you, what do you recommend with regards to um, not allowing our own pen test team to participate in the bug bounty so we you know we we like paying them for their day job yeah, but yeah. we don't want to incentivize you them. want to avoid cobra farming yeah right. we have like one of our guys is in your top 20 so we yeah. don't want to incentivize them to sandbag yeah how do we approach that that's, without you know pissing them off that's at the a same great time? way yeah well i mean I, I think in terms of how you approach that with the people in your team that's that's good luck with that uh <laughs> i think so so that's a reasonable conversation for you to have with them. It's it's actually not something that we run into that frequently in terms of preempting that. What we do do on the back end is basically look for people that work within an organization um, participating in the bug bounty program uh, if the customer said that that's not okay, right? Because some some get sensitive about that. You know, you get, you get into this the Dilbert cartoon about I'm going to go code myself a minivan. Uh, if you guys have seen that, so this whole idea of you know. Developers actually deliberately inserting vulnerabilities and then going and finding them through the bug bounty program Like we've never actually seen that happen And that would be a profoundly stupid thing to do because you've got git blame that would probably call it out fairly fast But it's something that people think about so we look for that um, The stuff that we do in there to actually identify that when it's happening in terms of setting rules and rules of engagement for your team I I mean look for that particular individual um, I, I would assume they have performance indicators and different things that actually 
give them feedback around whether or not they're doing a good job. If they suddenly pop up in your bug bounty program and their normal day job performance cliffs, then, then that's going to be a pretty obvious indicator that you've got a problem. But I, I wouldn't suggest, I wouldn't think that someone who is operating um, like that would, would deliberately go out and do that. It might be opportunistic or incidental, but to actually deliberately sandbag work that they're doing through the day and put their day job at risk just so they can collect some rewards at night, that to me it doesn't seem super rational. Just follow up question on that. So, would you know? Have you seen people, and does your plat platform allow for you know excluding those individuals from yeah. our specific program? Yeah, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Any others? Anything for Jim? I get off easy. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.